Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor. Really pleased to have Jeff Dice with me once again. Jeff is the president of the Mises Institute, and it's an educational organization dedicated to promoting Austrian economic economics, freedom, and peace. And, uh, of course, Jeff previously worked as a longtime advisor and chief of staff to Congressman Ron Paul. Uh, he has a background as a tax attorney uh, representing high net worth individuals, partnerships, and corporations. Uh, and um, his uh, tax career includes a time in uh, two, two different big four accounting firms. And uh, I think uh, Jeff is actually enjoying himself more now at the Mises Institute, uh, where, um, well, I just think uh, life is a little better for various reasons. And I think he's doing what he really enjoys. And if, he, if you're fortunate enough to be able to earn a living doing what you love to do, there's not. It doesn't get any better than that. Jeff, thanks for joining me again. Hey, Jay. It's great to talk to you. Always great to uh, hear from you. Uh, it isn't often enough as far as I'm concerned. There's just um, no way we can be more places than one at a given time. So, um, you know, I wanted your article recently that you wrote at the Mises Institute, Ray Dalio's Hollow Lament was the name of the article. And, you know, my son, Scott, uh, he's seeking to make his way in the investment world, and he's been sort of enchanted by Ray Dalio. Uh, he had read some of his books, and I guess maybe more than anything, because Dalio has made so much money, he finds uh, Dalio somebody he'd like to understand and probably emulate. Um, so I'm not sure to what extent uh, I did point out your article to Scott. I'm not sure. I haven't had a chance to find out yet if he's, re- if he's read it. Uh, but let's. I, I've titled today's show, Why Do Rich Capitalists Suggest the Destruction of Capitalism? It seems to be something that some of these guys like Dalio or Buffett or, you know, some of these guys, these billionaire guys, they get really, really rich. And then all of a sudden, they turn into bleeding heart liberals. Um, so what do you, how do you account for that, Jeff? I guess the short answer would be to say they've got theirs. <laughs> In other words, people need to understand the diminishing marginal utility of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're very, very wealthy, you're spending a tiny fraction of your income and wealth on basic necessities like housing and food. And mm-hmm. and also, if you're fantastically wealthy, you're not all that much worried about your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. You've got mm-hmm. plenty of money to set mm-hmm. them up and secure their future and pay for college and housing and, and all kinds of nice things. And so if you're a billionaire – just a just a single billionaire, not a deca or centa billionaire like some of these guys. Well, I don't know if we have centa billionaires, but we have deca billionaires. <laughs> if you just have a single billion and you lose 90% of all your income and wealth to some sort of government retribu- redistribution scheme, well, you've still got $100 million. You're, right. you're still a financial elite. You're still quite set. Whereas the, the poor average Joe with $400 in his checking account – uh, is utterly dependent on his next paycheck for, for immediate basics and necessities like rent and food and gasoline in the car to get to work and that sort of thing. Now, of course, there's a lot of degrees in between that. Let's say a, 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 someone's fortunate enough to have twenty or forty or $50,000 in the bank. Well, mm-hmm. the loss of a job would not be an immediate catastrophe for that person. But nonetheless, the loss of 90% of their, of their worth would, would make them uh, basically dependent on, on government and, and mm-hmm. their employers. So that's really the difference. It's all about diminishing marginal utility of money. And so when you reach a critical mass, which I would add all of these gentlemen did under our current tax and regulatory system, uh, it, it's interesting to me that they would now change that tax and regulatory system in a way that would prevent a lot of other people from ever becoming as successful as they were. And so I, I'm struck by the fact Mr. Dalio here uh, in, in particular, who it, by all accounts, exceedingly brilliant is super competent in his line of work, would now turn around and give uh, or argue for giving more of his money to government or to the public school system where he lives, where he's making a big donation. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, organizations that, unlike the businesses he bought and sold and turned around, have no accountability, no share price, no investors, no skin in the game, uh, but are just bureaucratic monoliths that exist in perpetuity and have the police state backing them up. Uh, so, 
it's it's what I what I termed his uh, latest writings a hollow lament. I meant to say that he's being hypocritical, that he's yeah. being tone deaf, that his his problems are not our problems, and I'm not interested in a rich guy's argument for big government. Mm-hmm. Well, you you know it may keep a lot of people from succeeding. I mean, not a lot, but keeping other people from achieving that level of wealth. But my concern, Jeff, is more on the middle class and what this sort of tax, because it seems as though whenever we have taxes that are raised, the, the big guys don't even pay that many taxes necessarily. They find ways to, you know, ways within the law to uh, to avoid paying as many taxes. But even if they did, as you point out, in that case, in the case of Dalio, he's so filthy rich that if he lost 90 percent, he's still very, very rich and uh, no problem. I mean, if he wants to, so you're saying he's giving some money to the local schools in Connecticut or wherever he lives. I think it's Connecticut. Right. So he can give, I mean, he can take his own money and give it away. That's uh, help others. God bless him for that, I think. I mean, my way of thinking is, um, you know, let me, Jay Taylor, do with what the excesses I have to take care of, first of all, of my family, my own family, and then maybe the neighbors that I love and care for. Or people around me that I that my life that my life touches that I care about that I know, uh, but put a gun to my head and tell me to send money to government, which wastes most of it anyway, and then finally a little trickles down to some needy people somewhere. Uh, it just you know it's just it just it, it infuriates me, and I think most people who think about it, easy enough to give uh, to give other people's money away, right? So. Now, can you talk a little bit about how and why capitalism needs to be reformed? That was the article that Dalio wrote. Essentially, can you go over some of the points and how does how is he specifically? What are the policies that he would put in place to make the world uh, a perfect place? Well, that's just it. The policies or ideas he outlines are so incredibly vague and so derivative and so unoriginal. I'm, I'm shocked yeah. by a guy as bright as him. He's he's lived in, in the performance world for so long, he doesn't know how to 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 adjust to the non-performance world of government, it appears. But he is full of vagaries. This article is, well, we need better leadership. Well, really? We need people who are better at government? I, I'm not sure that's the case. And he says, well, we need more bipartisanship. Okay, well, we haven't gotten that, though, over the last 30 or 40 years. And then mm-hmm. he starts talking about metrics, which, of course, don't exist in government. They exist in, in spades in the capital markets and, and private businesses where people actually lose money and lose their shirts. And, and then, of course, he has some very bland recommendations for redistributing income and wealth. But uh, my question here is, again – this tax system he, he now purports to advocate, which presumably involves higher rates, you know, what would have happened if that had been in place for the last 30 or 40 years? People mm-hmm. like him, uh, rich people generally get rich off of capital gains. In other words, they right. buy and sell things, and capital gains have historically in the United States been taxed at a lower percentage, a lower level than ordinary earned income, the average mm-hmm. guy making a paycheck. And so if all along – uh, Ray Dalio and, and his funds had been taxed at 70 percent, let's say, instead of 15 percent on all the tr- the buying and selling gains they'd made over the years. Perhaps he would never have achieved a critical mass of wealth that would enable him to today be a benefactor. Maybe mm-hmm. he'd just be like the, uh, you know, the, the somewhat well-to-do businessman who makes $400,000 a year and flies first class mm-hmm. uh, I- instead of being a billionaire who owns airplanes and companies. Yeah. So it, it's it's hard to say, and again, it smacks of this idea that like, well, now that I'm fabulously wealthy, let's uh, throw some impediments in other people's way. But yeah. in fact, I, I, you know, it's good that he's wealthy. By, yeah. by all accounts, he wasn't he he didn't earn his wealth illicitly or harmfully, and now he can uh, give it away. I, I think that's mm-hmm. fine. But I I don't want to hear him uh, chastising. People like me who argue for lower taxes for – how about on that mom and pop who own a couple of dry cleaners or restaurants and have a, a $2 million net worth? How about we, we lower their tax burden so they can you know, uh, be, become set for life? How about them? Mm-hmm. Well, even if he doesn't give his capital away, uh, if we had functioning markets, if, if we had functioning markets, if capital were allowed to be – uh, if, if price discovery were allowed for capital, which I would argue it is not now, um, then Dalio's money would be going to work somewhere in, in capital as capital that would be used to 
create more research and development, more jobs, more 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 wealth, essentially, more wealth creating activities. Um, but I guess maybe one of the problems that we're having, I believe, and I'm, I'm sh- quite sure you'll agree with me, is that we don't have price discovery because of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve has has really not allowed us to price capital. Um, is that? I mean, that's that's the kind of thing that I don't think. I don't know, maybe Dalio would touch on that, that sort of thing, I don't know. But we always hear the, the liberals talking about this redistribution of government has to get in to fix things. Instead of going back to, um, uh, to the basics, like let's get back to free markets so that scarce resources can be allocated efficiently. Uh, let me ask you this, Jeff. How do you think, uh, how would Ron Paul, your ex-boss, or any number of economists, or you yourself, propose uh, fixing the problems that Dalio is suggesting need to be fixed? Well, first and foremost, we would identify the single biggest driver of inequality is the Federal Reserve. I mean, Mm -hmm. Dalio, to his credit, he does point out that the Fed Fed policies have generally favored rich guys like him over over wages and workers. And and Mm -hmm. so he, he understands that, but he does not understand, or at least he doesn't admit to the degree that his own wealth was driven by the Fed, that it was created by the Fed. I mean, this mm-hmm. is a guy who probably would have been successful in any walk of life, mm-hmm. in any endeavor, a brilliant, hard-charging guy. I take nothing away from him. Mm-hmm. But the point is that interest rates have been so artificially low for so long that hedge funds like his have been borrowing money and buying companies with lots and lots of leverage to not too much equity. So this leverage buyout model uh, has made him very, very wealthy, probably fantastically uh, wealthier than he would have been without the Fed, without a or basically a rigged monetary system. So it's it's made him rich, maybe so rich that it makes him him blind to it. So the the, the number one thing we could do to create a, a more level playing field is to, as you said, allow price discovery because the whole idea of hedge funds is to allocate capital to better and higher uses. If a company's underperforming but it has value. The, the idea of a hedge fund is to go in there, buy that company out, replace the management, uh, shake things up, and 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 turn it around. And and I would argue that that is a noble and useful mm-hmm. uh, activity for capital in society, something that trickles down and helps everyone. Yes. But the, the, but the, the manner in which Dalio and other hedge fund managers have been able to do this with cheap money, almost house money, has has dramatically misaligned things. It's distorted things. It's it's made a lot of businesses look good on paper when in fact they don't work in reality. And and it's made people uh, maybe it hasn't created a class of undeserving rich, but it's made a class of rich people richer than they would have been. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as you point out, Dalio probably could have been successful at anything, uh, but with cheap money, with the easy money, much too much of it flying around, distorting. The markets, obviously, it's bidding resources, intellectual resources like Dalio and others. And I've known personally people, uh, Chen Lin, Chen Lin, who's a friend of mine, for example, uh, could have gone to, uh, to Princeton in an aeronautical program, aeronautical engineering program, uh, to get his PhD. But he was making so much money in the equity markets that he said, I'm not going to do that. I, I've, I've learned to know other people, too, hedge fund managers and the like, who haven't done things that might have been more directly beneficial to humankind, uh, but if those assets or those resources get bid away by a distorted capital markets, then it then we're all poorer for it in the long run. Although some people maybe end up uh, lining their pockets more more uh, considerably more than they would have otherwise. Well, Jeff, let me ask you, um, and for people who want to keep track of what's going on at the Mises Institute and listen, you have a lot of great programs on there. Uh, you host something every week. I think is it called? Uh, is it's it used to be Mises Weekends. I think you're calling it um, something different now. Is it? It's, uh, called, it's called the Human Action Podcast. Yes. It's, yeah. It's after in depth, in depth uh, dive into Austrian economics and and current events. So we're we're trying to apply principle and uh, academic structure to uh, what's happening in the real world. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's that's really good, and I, I need to start paying more attention to what you're doing. You do have economists on there. I saw recently, uh, actually, I think it was uh, towards the end of last year, 
you had uh, Daniel Lacalle. Is that how you pronounce his yeah, name? Yeah, Daniel Lacalle, great Spanish uh, uh, economist who's uh, really, really active in Europe. And this would still be available on your website. Uh, the biggest bubble of all was a was a show that you had a discussion that you had with him back in October of 2018. Uh, essentially, could you sort of summarize what his thesis is? Well, his thesis is that the uh, the the scariest bubble out there is corporate debt, mm-hmm. and that the American public and the the Western public and that the investing public hasn't quite yet. Uh, recognize this, and thus it's perhaps not already priced in to some of these exuberant market valuations we've seen over the past few years, and that uh, people need to understand that the debt problems at the ha- household and individual level, at the business and corporate level, and at the government governmental level have all gotten worse, not better, since 2008 and the crash. Uh, so it was a very interesting and, and sobering discussion of how much corporate debt is out there sloshing around. And yet, uh, for, for a lot of companies, it still continues to trade at uh, pretty low interest rates. I do see mm-hmm. that Netflix, uh, which is a company that makes no money and has a, a, an unholy amount of debt, is now uh, starting to be bid up on its bond debt, almost not, not into junk bond territory yet, but it's getting up into that 7-ish percent range. So mm. there's uh, there's risk. There's money to be made, perhaps, with great risk out there. Uh, but it's it's interesting to me to see, I don't know if we still use the term blue chip, but to see a dominant U.S. company like Netflix, which is in millions and millions and millions of houses all across the country, uh, nonetheless struggle to make money and, fi- and finds itself uh, in a precipitous situation having to issue uh, more and more corporate debt at higher and higher rates. It's uh, Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S.org is the place that uh, our listeners should go to. Uh, there's just an awful lot of material there, a lot of, um, a, a lot of articles and also a, a weekly. Uh, Jeff, you host this weekly, uh, this week, this weekly podcast that, that is excellent. Um, there's some of the others that I saw that really look interesting. Why Socialism Persists. Uh, this is one that I think you did on your own. Um, why does it persist? I mean, here we have, you know, example after example of how socialism always seems to end up in poverty for the masses. There may be a, a small number of people who get filthy rich, but the rest always suffer. And and yet, we just keep going back to it again. What What is it about the human species that causes us to do the same thing over and over again and never learn from the past? And then specifically with regard to socialism. Isn't that interesting? Because people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are thought of to bring new ideas to Congress when in yeah. fact her ideas are ancient. Uh, and they've been thoroughly disproven both in theory and in practice. Uh, Ludwig von Mises literally wrote the book on socialism by that same title in 1922, which is just a, a, an absolute demolition of the economic program of central planning. So I, I think the short answer is that there, there is an element of human nature that likes something for nothing. And, and of course, it, it's hard for people to understand because it's only in government and economics where we find that oftentimes doing nothing beats doing something. Mm-hmm. And I think as humans, we're hardwired to prefer action over for, forbearance. And I think that psychologically, uh, intellectually, the the idea of you know something beats nothing. The idea that someone has a program or a plan uh, always sounds good to us. It sounds activist, like we're doing something to improve the world, even if it's making it worse, in, in effect, because we we have this idea that you know that we have to act. And in almost every walk of life, other than politics and government and economics, in almost every other walk of life, you know, action beats forbearance. Mm-hmm. Right, being being proactive and doing things and planning sure. and plotting and working and striving mm-hmm. uh, is is a good thing in in almost every human endeavor. But that's the last thing we need in our political and banking elites. And this is just very hard for people to come to grips with. They want government to do something about X, Y, and Z. And oftentimes, the best thing for government to do is nothing, and mm-hmm. in fact, stop doing things altogether. Well, somehow our founding fathers sort of had a had that inclination for sure. I'm wondering, uh, it's really uh, encouraging to me, and I wasn't quite aware that the Mises Institute was doing this, but, you know, uh, obviously for intellectuals, for people who 
really care to understand economics and how economics really works, not the way they've been indoctrinated to think they work. Uh, but Mises and the Austrian School of Economics, that's what you're, that's what the Mises Institute is all about. I'm really encouraged to hear what I think I heard you say a little bit ago, that you're really, uh, your guests are really out there trying to connect the theory with the real world. Did I, do I have that right? Right. That's, uh, that's really what economics is, is supposed to be about. It's supposed to help us understand the world. You could say that about all sciences. But it has failed to do so, I would argue, in the last 50 years or so. In other words, economics has gone astray, and we've lost it to uh, mathematics, to modeling, to statistics, to, to psychology, to a whole host of fields that aren't really economics at the end of the day. And, and what I fear is that not only are modern economists at places like the Fed and in the financial press you know, not helping us better understand the world, they're actually misleading us. They're uh, helping us understand the world less, not mm-hmm. more, and, and mm-hmm. uh, they're not predicting anything successfully. They're not modeling anything successfully, and for all their talk of empiricism against theory, uh, all, all the empiricism in the world didn't much help uh, anybody in 2008. So uh, w- I think we find ourselves in a time where economics is trying to reclaim itself and trying to reclaim its spot uh, as as a needed field, as a vital field against all the uh, you know hyphenated studies and sociology and psychology. So uh, economics is is uh, is in a tough spot, and mm-hmm. I would say that uh, our our part of our goal is to help improve uh, what economics is out there and to to promote what we consider correct or sound economics. Well, it's certainly uh, anybody that's taken the time to examine Mises uh, and Austrian economics, I think, will will be able to see, unless they've been so thoroughly indoctrinated by Keynesianism and the other isms out there in the universities, uh, if they just – the common folks can understand Austrian economics to a great extent because it is so much in touch with the way the world really works, not the way somebody in academia thinks it should work. And it seems to me that what's happening more than anything is – that this idea that I don't have to do anything, government will take care of me, uh, something for nothing, is really very regressive, and it causes societies to go down the tube. Uh, go down the tubes, it would seem. Jeff, uh, we're out of time. I want to thank you so much for being with us. I just wanted to mention there's so many other people there. Uh, Mises.org, and is it every Saturday? That every uh, you update it on the weekends, right? Your, Generally, your yes, we do it. We do a, a human action podcast once a week. You can find it right. in, in uh, via YouTube or iTunes or Stitcher or a variety of outlets, uh, and also you can find it at Mises dot org, our website. That would be the best place to go. Jeffrey Herbener, uh, the theory of interest rates, March twenty eighth was one I looked at. Joe Salerno, who I'd like to get on my show sometime. Mises and nationalism, which would be a good good topic. I'd like to hear what Joe has to say. I didn't have time to listen to it. There's so many things there. So folks, I hope that you'll go there uh, and familiarize yourself with the Mises uh, Institute. Thanks, Jeff, for being with us. We'll look to do it again sometime soon. Thank you, Jeff. 